Our speaker is Tony Carnevale. He's a research professor and the director of the Center on Education and the Workforce at Georgetown University. He has served as vice president of the Educational Testing Service and senior staff in the U.S. Senate and House. In 1993, President Bill Clinton appointed him to chair the National Commission on Employment Policy. He was subsequently appointed by President George W. Bush to serve on the White House Commission on Technology and Adult Education. Carnevale co-authored the principal affidavit in Rodriguez v. San Antonio, a U.S. Supreme Court action to remedy unequal education benefits and fiscal reforms. Please join me in welcoming Tony Carnevale. I can't sing, no. I turned down the background music. Um, accreditation is probably a good place to start. All of you are part of uh, what is increasingly clear, and that is a fundamental change in the way we in the United States do post-secondary education. A fundamental change in the way it is bought and sold, fundamental changes in the way it's organized, fundamental change in the way it's validated or accredited. And the, the shift, I would argue, in broad form, because the details are horrendously complicated. The shift in broad form is from a system that was largely supply driven, wherein educators essentially validated each other. A pretty fair, if thumbnail, sketch of the accreditation process uh, to a system that is much more driven by outcomes. And the outcomes that the public is interested in are fairly clear. That is, they want, and policymakers want, a system that provides people with learning, clear and measured learning, a very difficult thing to do except in areas where there's a strong attachment between uh, the curriculum and specific tasks and activities in the labor force, for instance, or very uh, specific credentialing requirements in professions and other kinds of occupations. In history, not so easy. Um, and then, uh, in addition to some way for us to begin to measure learning, which I think is the toughest outcome standard to deal with, and I expect will come last, uh, there is a demand that we reduce cost, somewhat unfair. In truth, the returns to education have grown to the point where our investments nationally should be growing. Uh, and growing faster than they are. We now spend about $470 billion a year on post-secondary education. If we calculate its contributions to GDP, uh, which are now much higher than they ever were before, we should be spending a larger share of GDP on education. The difficulty is the money's not there because we're at the same time being forced to spend more and more money on people like me. Uh, and that is older Americans who are retiring and require lots of health care. And so, and thank you for that. Um, <laughs> I support that. And so there are going to be hard choices made between uh, paying for retirees in one way or another, which is consumption in the end. Uh, those of us who are on pensions or will be, uh, we are consumers. Why don't you stop working? You're really not a producer in an economic sense. And so there's a real tight tension now between what we do with our public money and our private money, but public money I think is the more significant question. What we do with our public money in terms of whether we invest it in young people especially, in working age Americans, or we invested in consumption among older Americans. One has a very high payoff. The other is clearly a part of our social contract with among the generations. And so there is a, a tension here. 
and add to that national security, which has suffered as much as education, where our spending, in not in absolute terms, but in proportional terms, have been going down for more than 15 years. That's also true of national defense spending and national security spending, relative to spending on older people. And that's not over, even when we reach full employment, let's say by 2017, when we will surely be there, we'll still have about a 450 billion full employment deficit. That is, we will be spending, with no increases in the current budget, $450 billion more at the federal level than we take in. And the numbers are similar in the states because of Medi uh, Medicaid and uh, other expenditures at the state level. So we're in a bind. And there's a question as to whether or not we can increase taxes sufficiently uh, to make up for that difference. But the difficulty is, even at current spending levels, we're underspending in our investments on infrastructure, on education, on training, arguably in health care and a variety of other areas as well. So there is a persistent stress in the American system that is probably not going away uh, and will be with us for some time to come. We'll get a little bit of a respite between now and 2020, but then the retirement costs begin to go through the roof. And we'll be back where we were a few years ago when we were looking at trillion dollar deficits. So this whole conversation occurs in the context of a constrained public sector. That, I think, is the fundamental problem. In the end, it's not about where the returns are. We know the returns to education are very high. They almost have to be very high. And that is, you get education in four and five year bites when you're young, couple year bites or year bites when you're older, and you work for 45 or 50 years. If it's worth anything at all, the cumulative value over 45 or 50 years is always going to be greater than the cost of the education at the beginning, in part because education is really only part of the learning system that at least is associated with the American economy. The education budget runs uh, close to 500 billion, but every year in the, private, in the employer sector, there's another 117 billion spent on formal training of American workers, and another 400 billion or so in informal OJT on the job. And so there's a big university out there, which is work itself. The difficulty being that that university of the workplace requires upgrades. The career ladders are shorter and shorter. Uh, entry level requirements are higher and higher. And so in order to move up or move ahead or move sideways, people need to leave the work-based learning system and get some kind of formal learning outside that allows them to move sideways, move up, move diagonally. Uh, the whole system is less like a ladder now, the very linear way we used to think of learning in America, and it's more like a climbing wall. People move all around uh, in learning and employment systems now. It's no longer linear. And so there is this fundamental issue uh, which challenges us, and that is cost. And the public uh, and political leadership both want costs to come down, in part because they don't really have much choice. You can be a very strong supporter of education, and American politicians are. Whenever they get any extra money, they spend it on education, but they're in a box now. That is, they don't, the money comes now, it goes to retirees. That's the simple way to put it. And a lot more of it looks to be going to defense or may need to be in sporadic bursts of defense spending, which is the way we've done it over the past decade. We put the wars on a credit card. At some point, we've got to stop doing that because you still have to pay off the credit bill. So there is a, uh, a real tension here uh, which suggests that for cost reasons alone, for efficiency reasons, education, learning is going to have to be delivered in alternative formats and alternative ways, and the demand for efficiency is overwhelming. At the same time, uh, as a people, we value the non-economic returns to education, and they are high. They are tightly connected to our commitment as a republic, to a commitment that all people's lives have equal value, and that individuals 
need education to develop themselves so that they can live fully in their time. And our times are more and more complex and require more learning to negotiate. What are we supposed to think about the Middle East? So there is a, uh, another kind of demand, and that one's at risk because it doesn't bring high economic return or immediate return. And if push comes to shove, I think it's fair to say that political leadership and parents and even students will reach for the economic value first. Because in a republic, what is important is that you develop as a person. In a capitalist economy, what is important is that you have a job. And while the core purpose of education doesn't really change, it is to allow people to live fully in their time. I think we all know that. But at the same time, in a capitalist economy, you can't live fully in your time if you're living under a bridge. And so there's a dual demand on education. Both the economic and non-economic value are real and a priority in most people's lives. The opinion polls show us that. But the shift to economic value is coming very strong. So the other outcome standard that is emerging with a vengeance is employment, that is, will the program you're in, not the institution, because institutions don't get you jobs. What gets you a job is your field of study. Doesn't matter if you go to Harvard, if you become a school teacher from Harvard or a school teacher from Michigan State, you make the same money. What matters is field of study. And we live in a world where what matters most to people is institution elite and selective versus non-selective and so on. But the real economic basis of education is programmatic. And so what's emerging, I think fairly aggressively, truthfully, is measurement systems that are trying to determine whether particular fields of study, particular field uh, of uh, endeavor that they connect to, particular programs, whether they're provided by the private sector, the public sector, uh, even one might think at some point here, because we're sliding that way, by employers themselves in the form of industry-based certifications, which now 30 million Americans carry out of a workforce of 140 million. And so more and more what matters is whether what you're learning gets you a job, whether the job is worth the price of the earnings, and it almost always is, sometimes isn't, 20% of BAs make high school wages. But pretty much, learning pays off in, in the main. And then the third thing is, do you work in your field of study? Because if we as a people are going to pay for you to take heating, ventilation, and air conditioning, we're not going to be happy if you end up working in a pharmacy. So one of the things that the consistent demands in these accountability systems are basically employment, wages, and field of study. Although field of study sometimes doesn't work very well, there are many cases where the best thing to do is to work outside your field of study. Nursing, for instance. Education, for instance. If you're an education major, the best way to increase your income is not to become a teacher. It's true. So in the end, the... Uh, the outcome standards, I think, are coming, and when they arrive, they'll be here to stay. How they will be enforced, the initial phases in these structure standings, uh, as you look at them in the states and at the federal level as they emerge uh, in Congress and in state legislatures as well, uh, the initial phases are all about transparency. That is, the notion that uh, students or people who are moving into education programs have a right to know, as the Wyden Rubio bill says, uh, a right to know before they go. What the prospects are for returns, employment, earnings, etc. Less interest on the part of the policymakers in learning. The preoccupation with learning is mostly with the educators, because that's the business you're all in. But the rest of us are more focused on whether or not somebody got a job. Now, of course, uh, in the end, uh, we're going to have to measure learning or people will start handing out degrees uh, for a nickel apiece. On the other hand, if those get people jobs, then we just found a very efficient way to run our education system. So uh, there is a, um, 
there is a framework emerging for what in the end is probably going to be, I would argue, the regulation of education in America that will be driven by outcome standards. With a private sector that allows people to do whatever they want. If you want to pay 60 grand a year to go to a selective college like the one I teach at, that's your business. On the other hand, we do have a right to make demands on private colleges because they operate on public money too. That is, they are not for profit, which is a huge economic advantage, and they get plenty of money from governments and other ways as well. So in the end, when these outcome standards emerge, and all of those proposed, at least in legislation, contemplate uh, outcome measurement in both public and private institutions. So I think that's the, the soup we're in at the moment. It is, in the end, uh, becomes very complex. One question is, how did we get here? Because a lot of people will tell you, I don't see why it is that you need a certificate in an HVAC when the people who used to do that were just uh, people who graduated from high school. And that's a good question. But what we do know is that in the 1970s, 75% of Americans had no more than high school, or they were high school dropouts, and the vast majority of them were in the middle class, basically in modern earnings between forty-five and $90,000 a year. So they were doing forty-five grand or better, basically, in real dollars. So um, something happened. Uh, in the 70s, we actually saw the value of education after high school go down. It fell down to a wage advantage over high school of about 39%. But then something else happened in 1983, which was at first very mysterious. Nobody understood why. After college wages or post-secondary wages kept falling, of great concern to a lot of people because the view was we were moving toward an economy of service jobs that were low wage and low skill and productivity was taking away all our manufacturing jobs. Half of that was true. Productivity was taking away all our manufacturing jobs. But at the same time, we were moving toward a high wage service economy, which is what we have now. There are three reasons that happened. Number one, consumption shifted as we became wealthier. And we have become a lot wealthier. We're talking about $3 trillion GDP then and $17 trillion now. We're a lot richer than we used to be. And as productivity increased in manufacturing, consumption moved to services. Not just pizza delivery, but business services, legal services, education, health care, and a whole series of other finance, a whole series of much more highly paid service sector jobs. The second thing that happened was that the fundamental terms of competition changed. And this is more the business story. And that is, in the old days, the way America competed, and nobody was better than we were, the way we competed was we produced very high volumes of standardized goods and services at low cost and low prices. But in a service-based economy, the demands are much higher than that. There's a demand for quality, for high variety, for customization of both goods and services to the needs of individuals for continuous uh, improvement and uh, novelty, for speed, getting to market first with the innovation, customized to the needs of uh, individual consumers or small groups of consumers, and in a world where consumers participated actively in producing the service or the good. So there is a, uh, a fundamental shift in the terms of competition. So we had a shift from in productivity in manufacturing and the old blue collar economy killed off a lot of those jobs, consolidated them where there was five people working on a factory floor. These days it, it comes down to one technician. And then a shift in consumption to high wage services and higher value demands in both goods and services. And then the third thing is that the way we produce goods and services, the recipes of production changed. So one example is that nowadays we give about a nickel of every dollar we spend on food to the farmer. The rest goes to 
manufacturing, business services, finance, design, lawyers, architects, the service load necessary to create not mass production standardized goods, but goods and services with quality, variety, customization, convenience, speed, innovation, etc., required a much richer mix of workers. And that richer mix in the end uh, meant more high skill, although that is something of an a inchoate idea in the sense that which skills, what skills are we talking about? And so there is a, uh, we came to a point also where the structures of production changed from top-down hierarchies to very complicated networks. And that required more high skill, people more autonomous, uh, and those institutions and all those we work in, uh, assignments and authority is overlapping and not clear. Uh, it's not clear who's the boss all the time. People have to bring all of their talent to work, not just their ability to drill a hole over, again, over and over again during a day. So it became uh, an economy that required much higher skill. And in the American context, that meant post-secondary skill. Didn't have to mean that. There was nowhere else to go. The workforce we had was a high school workforce. We needed something more. Something more in America means post-secondary. Could have built another institution to do this. It was, for those of you who remember, in the 70s, there was a move by the federal government to build the job training system, CETA, the Comprehensive Employment and Training Act, which most people thought would grow into a fairly large system for job training, which would be different than education. Never happened. I mean, what was foolish about that is we had this huge asset post-secondary institutions, and in the end, for simple efficiency reasons, that was the place to go. That's where all our capital was. We had to change that institution so it's, it served new purposes. And that's what con continues to go on, with no small amount of tension about the purposes of that institution. And so we've come to a point where post-secondary education uh, is a big grab bag of a lot of different things and a lot of different technologies. It's not clear where it's located anymore. It's in the workplace, it's in traditional institutions, it's on the net, uh, God knows where it'll be next year. So there is a, a transformation going on here. The tendency of policymakers, I must say, when confronted with that level of complexity, is to do nothing. It's too complicated. Let the system sort itself out. Let people compete and let the system sort itself out. The problem with that is not an efficiency problem, I would argue, because the market will sort efficiently, ultimately. It's an equity problem. And that is more and more outcome standards demanded of post-secondary institutions, the competition for um, funding from individual families and governments, based on outcome standards has a negative effect on equity because if you're running an institution and you want uh, your difficulty is that public money is in decline in relative terms and your difficulty is that the public standard, these outcome standards, are coming at you in a rush and demanding that you educate people more effectively, faster, cheaper, and better. Well, in that kind of environment, the way you win, especially if your budget's going down, is you educate the people who are most available and who have checkbooks uh, that can afford the education you supply in a declining resource environment. And what that does, and has been doing since the middle 90s, has been turning American post-secondary education into a, a structure that more and more results in intergenerational reproduction of privilege. So that more and more, when we look at the selective colleges, they're whiter and richer, relative to the size of the white youth population. More and more, there's access for low-income kids and minorities and adults, but those second-class students, non-traditional we call them, <laughs> 
in many respects, because most of them are working. That set of students more and is concentrates more and more uh, in the two-year schools, the open admission four-year schools, and public training programs, which are relatively small in that mix. And we do 400 odd billion a year in post-secondary spending. We do 18 billion a year in training. Five billion, I think, in WIA or WIOA. Uh, and then some other money scattered around in other places. So there is a, uh, there is a distributional effect of all this, and it tends to reproduce the society that it sits in. Because what's happened now more and more is that your access to post-secondary learning determines your earnings prospects over a lifetime. We know that, as everybody talks about on TV, America is becoming more and more unequal all the time, and that's true. What often doesn't get said is it's not just about the 1%. In fact, it's, truthfully, there's, they don't have much to do with it. If we took all the money the 1% has made since 1983 and redistributed it to the rest of the people who are below median income, they'd each get about $7,000. College education is worth a good 20, 25,000 a year, every year. So what really separates us more and more is access to learning after high school. That used to take place on the job, it still does. Employers still train, but they don't train untrained people. And so there's a new ante in the game that says you've got to have skill to get skill in the big university out here in the economy. And so, uh, in the end, that issue is one that's not going to go away. It becomes more and more difficult. The people who run these numbers is a guy named David Oder, who's done this over and over and over again. Um, he finds continuously that about 70% of the increase in inequality in the United States is due to differences in education. 30% is due to all the other stuff. Decline of unions, decline of manufacturing, low minimum wage. Uh, reduced spending in government programs that tends to equalize or at least create greater equality in income and so on. So in a lot of ways what's happened is that what you do post-secondary, not to mention K-12, which prepares people for post-secondary learning or learning on the job or uh, lifelong learning, more and more that apparatus is uh, sits right at the tension, the center of the tension between democracy and capitalism. Because in a democratic society, everybody is equal in some way or other. We've never really figured out how. But we do believe that every life has equal value. We don't think everybody should be equal. Americans are more uncomfortable with inequality than any nation in the world. And that's because we have a belief in upward mobility. Well, it's not clear that we're getting much of that anymore, and education has become part of that problem. It's now the capstone in an education system, post-secondary is, the capstone in an education system connected to economy that very reliably, without racism, without class bias, without all the ugly things we see from time to time, pretty well guarantees that if you're black, Hispanic, if you're low income and working class, you won't do as well as other people. Your grades won't be as high, your test scores won't be as high. If you're female, you'll make less money. So that structure is now more and more reliable because education has become articulated as a part of it. It's a bigger set of institutional determinants now that drive us. Free will, work effort, entrepreneurship, all of that matters less than it used to. So there is a fundamental problem here, and in the end, it's only solved by government policy, something that none of us are interested in. So there is a, and the government itself has got its own problems. Uh, it's too busy trying to take care of people like me, and we're going to be sure that the rest of you don't get the money you need. So, you know, there is a... Uh, there, is a, there is a fundamental difficulty here. What it says to me for all of you is that this, this is the new normal for you. The urge to innovate, the urge uh, to unbundle 
what you do and break it into elements that can be priced and costed separately. Even the urge to separate that 40% of a four-year college major that is for the major and the 60% of the, of the coursework that is general education. The urge to separate those two, to unbundle that, I think is coming in a lot of middle-range colleges. The elites will survive just fine because what is preferred and still the gold standard is a very strong general education and the skills it gives you mixed with a very strong specific occupational or technical education. That's where the leverage is. But we can't afford that for everybody. And so more and more, those of us who are working class, low income, adults, minorities, we get the job training. And people who are more affluent get the whole show. And in some respects, there's no way around that. If, pe if people want to spend their own money for their kids' education and they want to buy Harvard, that's their business, I think, is the way most Americans feel. The real issue is what happens to everybody else. And I think you people are a big part of that story. In many ways, you're the cutting edge of reform and change in education. You're part of institutions oftentimes, I think, uh, that don't fully appreciate uh, that you are part of that. You're non-credit, oftentimes, customized, job-related. You will be the people who, in the end, will lead, it seems to me, on uh, education where curriculums are very tightly tied to and aligned with uh, career requirements uh, in the workplace, so-called competency-based education, paced at the uh, paced in a way that allows individuals to work and learn their way uh, up, combined in some way with what they're learning on the job in ideal cases, that what you're learning in school and what you're doing when you go to work are pretty much the same thing. That's where the highest earnings payoff come. So I think that is pretty much the state we're in. I don't see relief coming by way of uh, public expenditure or uh, because there's going to be a squeeze there that won't go away, I think, for some time. What you see around you with the administration's attempts at building ratings and all the rest of that is the beginning of an attempt to build an operating system for the education system. Uh, one person I know who's involved in that says that education is like this big computer with no operating system. It just runs. Uh, and I think he has a point. Uh, and in the end, it seems to me, uh, I don't think anybody knows what that looks like in the end. We're going to find out by feeling our way in the dark. It's clearly what we're doing uh, in, the, in the meantime. Uh, in the end, at some point, there'll be uh, an assessment of all this, I suspect, looking backward, and people will begin to talk about problems that are systemic and need to be dealt with. For the moment, uh, I think where we are is there's only so much money, and you're all going to be asked to compete for it using whatever advantages you have. Uh, and that is oftentimes not the best way to get things done, but it does ensure that things do get done. So if you're a policymaker, if you're working for a senator or congressman and you're a staff person, probably one option you need to give them is do nothing. Go and defend the existing appropriation for Pell Grants, compromise, but don't try to change the system because nobody knows where to go with it. We do know that outcome stands are a good idea. Probably there ought to be transparency. Where do we go with that? Well, there's a, a deep revulsion against taking away uh, the leverage of general education and the society at large. How do we deal with that? Well, in the end, we'll allow those who people who can afford it to have that. And the public system will be more and more dedicated to giving uh, fairly uh, career-specific kinds of education and training to everybody else. In the end, I must say as an economist that that's not the worst solution because what has always been true in America is that the labor market is more democratic than higher education is. That is, you can make your way in the economy. It's tougher to do now because you have to have skill, but you don't have to go to Harvard. So in the end, it seems to me that uh, as has always been the case for education, educators in the United States, at least since I've uh, been involved with them, you're in the middle of another great adventure. Uh, and I wish you luck on that. Thank you.
Well, uh, I know we're running uh, a little late, but it was great talk. So let's take one or two quick questions if you have them. Please step, please step up to the mic. Thank you very much. Thank you. Well, thank you, folks. And uh, this brings the 100th UPCEA conference to a close. Uh, I look forward to seeing you at uh, the various events, the regionals, the online, the marketing, uh, and the other great events that UPCEA puts on. And uh, if I don't see you before then, I'll see you in San Diego a year from now. So thank you. We're adjourned.